What I'm going to be teaching you in this workshop is I'm going to, much like a student of this subject, I'm going to bring together like a tapestry, everything that I believe has already been laid out before us by those who have done this for longer than us, like Gary Urofsky, and from the work that I've done myself, and from colleagues like Joey Carbstrong, who we have in the building here today with us. So I'm going to tell you what I think are patterns, common patterns, that we can all apply within our outreach, and I'm actually going to give you a truly adaptable approach for everybody, okay? And the reason why it's an approach for everybody is because I'm actually not going to give you Paul Bashir's special approach. I'm just going to tell you what I've observed, what I've analyzed within the movement that is tried and true and works no matter who uses these tools, okay? So that's all I'm doing. I'm just telling you what I've observed that's worked and what I've practiced myself and I know works. I'm gonna start at the top though. I'm gonna start with the definition of veganism because in our movement currently, everybody seems to have their own definition. Have you noticed? Right, does this bother you guys? Do you wish we were all on the same page about this? Yeah, okay, well, I'm gonna to attempt to do that right now. So the actual definition, if you go back, all the way back, only pertains to animals. It's a way of living that excludes all forms of animal exploitation. In other words, you live a life anti-animal abuse, just like you would be anti-racism, anti-child abuse, anti any other injustice that subjects people to oppression or others to oppression. Does that make sense? It's very basic, isn't it? It's very simple. Somehow our movement has conflated this with other things and we've made it more confusing. We've conflated it with health. We've conflated it with environmentalism. And it seems to get further and further away from animal rights. When in actuality, it is only about animal rights. And the only reason why we talk about the health and environment aspects is because animal abuse is the biggest injustice in the world to the point where it does impact our health and the environment. That's how large the injustice is. So we should really be focusing on the core problem here that's creating the mess that we're in, the problem that's leading to our environmental crisis, the problem that's leading to our health crisis, not talking about the health and environment to get people interested. I'm also gonna talk about why that's a myth Vegan activism, I'm also going to define for you in a very simple way as put by Gary Urofsky. You simply speak for animals in the same way that you would want to be spoken for if you were in their position. And whenever in doubt, you only have to remember this if you forget why you're doing this. If you lose your way in the heat of the moment perhaps, just remember that you're speaking for animals in the same way that you would want to be spoken for if you were in their position. Does that make sense? Yeah. Pretty simple stuff. This will help you not to get sidetracked because there's a lot of bullshit in our movement right now that it will get you feeling different ways and thinking different things. You will get distracted, I'm telling you. So just remember, that's all you need to do as an activist is speak with that in mind. The other thing I'm going to tell you is to stop being the new and start being the tried and true. Stop thinking that you have a special approach that works better than other people because that's also ruining our movement. This ego. Lots of people tell me to do what Earthing Ed does, right? I understand where they're coming from. They think that they know better, right? They think that they know something that works better. But how many people here feel confident to do what Earthing Ed does? Raise your hand. Not one person. Everybody I've asked this question likes to view what he does, learn from what he does, but could never see themselves doing anything remotely close to what he does because he speaks too patiently. He's so well educated. He's got that British accent that you can't mimic, right? It makes him sound so much more intelligent. It makes it seem like you have to do this for years before you can get to that level. So we need to stop trying to achieve a special approach that ticks all the boxes. What we need to do is just stick to what is tried and true. So I'll get into that a bit more. Tried and true just means nuts and bolts, things that always work in every circumstance, no matter what your approach is. 
Sure, there are some people out there that think that they can do what Earthling Ed does and they resonate and they feel confident to do that. But most people don't. In fact, I've never heard anyone actually say that to me. But certain things do apply to everybody and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, a lot of people say that my approach, Joey's approach, is too aggressive, too direct and too extreme. Well, they don't say too direct actually, that's just the truth of it, it is just direct. But they say too extreme, too aggressive, making the vegan movement look bad. Now, I just want you guys to know that everybody has the right to their opinion, but they don't have their right to facts, right? You can't tell Joey that he's not an effective activist. You can't tell him that he doesn't actually convince people to go vegan and to take animal rights seriously. If you try to claim that, you're a liar. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to everybody in this movement. So then what's really happening here? Why are people saying this then? If we're really effective in real life, why are people trying to tell us that we're not? Like, that seems counterproductive, really, doesn't it? So the reality here is that people are projecting their own insecurities onto activists like me and Joey because they could never see themselves putting that much truth in that conversation they're having with someone and holding someone to account at that level. They see that as confrontational and perhaps fighting words. They think it's fighting words, like someone's going to fight you if you say this to them. What I'm going to show you today, again, this applies to everybody, and I'm going to show you that the things that we actually say to people don't cause the kind of reaction that you would fear. They actually cause people to respect you a lot more and more importantly to respect the message, which is why we're out there. We want people to take this message seriously, don't we? Right, so another thing I'm going to explain here is the difference between aggressive and violent because these two words have been conflated and people think that being aggressive means that you're violent, but it's not true. In fact, if you look at the definition of the word aggressive, it just means that you're driving forward and getting something done. People use that in sports all the time. Oh yeah, good quarter, he was really aggressive. Does he mean that he was violent and beating people up in that quarter? Obviously not, he just played with a lot of aggression and he got it done, right? So aggression is not a bad thing. In fact, if you look at what's happening to the animals and you don't feel angry, I would say see a psychologist. There's something wrong with you. If you're not angry, you're not paying attention. So anger is completely normal in this situation. Nobody should ever make you feel ashamed. Put your anger into activism. And the only thing that has given me fulfillment in my activism is effective activism. So when you put your anger into activism and you find success in your activism, you will feel fulfilled. Like I said before, this is really simple, but sometimes we get lost in minutia, we get lost in the source, and we forget how simple this stuff is. When it comes to morality, there's this idea out there that it's subjective. I don't buy into that at all, and I think that that's problematic to our movement to think that that's the case, because morality is very black and white. In the instance of child abuse, you would never have a day where you go over to this side and decide that child abuse is okay, right? It's never going to waver. It's always going to be evil. There's never going to be a day where you think murder is okay, rape is okay, or any of the things that I could list, right? Does everyone agree with that, disagree with that? Yes. Right, so morality is black and white, right? Like my t-shirt, right? Yep. So when people try to stump us and go, yeah, but you know, there's a gray area to this that you're not considering, you're not open-minded, that is a distraction and a manipulation tactic, and you should know better. Because when it comes to animal abuse, there is no gray area. How can you justify this? You can't. It's important to have that in mind when you're dealing with people. Okay, so also there is no excuse under the sun that could ever be thrown at you that will truly stump you if you keep in mind what I just told you and everything I'm going to tell you. So you should never feel stumped by anything that's thrown at you because the excuses, no matter what they are, are ridiculous. re dick you less all of them. Did you know the circle of life originates from the Lion King? Raise your hand if you knew that. Nobody. Right. Did you know that? You had a feeling. 
Why doesn't anybody talk about this? Why are we letting non-vegans say this shit and not holding them to account for this? Your reason for abusing animals comes from the Lion King? I mean, this just goes to show how comical this is, yeah. right? So just remember, no matter what excuse you get, there is nothing that can stump this. I'm going to talk to you about why focusing on being liked as a vegan is a massive flaw. In no other circumstance do we go out into the world and we think being liked is more important than the task at hand or the mission at hand, right? We also know that people don't really like people who care too much about being liked. We actually like people who don't care about what other people think of them, right? Isn't that how the world works? Why is it that every vegan currently, though, focuses on being liked as a priority? Doesn't really resonate with the way the world works, does it? So we think if we say the right thing, do the right thing, and the person that we're talking to likes us, they'll go vegan. What happens when they don't like you anymore? All right? They go back to abusing animals? It doesn't work. Even if they did like you and that was the reason why they went vegan, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. People respect the truth. And have you ever heard the expression real recognize real? It's like a urban saying in hip hop, real recognize real. That's a deep expression. When you say something to someone that's truthful, they find it familiar. That's why they don't react in a negative way that you would expect, some kind of aggressive manner. It might be negative in the sense that it won't be the answer you're looking for, perhaps, because they're still conceding through excuses, etc. But you're never going to get this response where people say, Oh, what? You're holding me accountable. I'm going to you know, fight with you or whatever. Hudson in the back over there. Can you please tell them? You're 18 years old, right? Yes. Okay. So you've been trying this method. Look how small this guy is, <laughs> right? He's approaching people twice his size and telling him, you're a hypocrite, you're an animal abuser. Has anybody ever been aggressive to you? Not one you? person. I've gotten more respect doing this approach than I ever have. Mm. These people don't see me as some politician trying to sell them something. I'm just a normal dude who's just trying to fight animal abuse and people respect it so much. Mm. Again, you guys need to try this out for yourself before you know this to be true. That's the only way you'll know this to be true. And the other thing is, in this movement, we think that veganism is about love and compassion. And we don't talk about the fact that it's merely a justice issue. Being a non-racist isn't about love necessarily. It's just wrong to be a racist. It's an injustice. Um, and we don't love every child in the world necessarily in order for us to be against child abuse, right? We just know that it's wrong no matter whose child it is and which child it is, right? So the same thing applies here. But I also want to explain how this approach that I'm talking to you about right now is actually the real form of love and compassion that we can give to people. If you really want to break it down and be honest about what love and compassion is, you don't lie to your friends. When you pander and you focus on being liked as a vegan as a priority and you say things that compromise on the message, well, in that scenario, you lost, right? Because you're focusing on getting love and compassion rather than giving it. Does that make sense? You want love and compassion from this animal abuser you're talking to because you want them to like you so much. But you're not extending love and compassion for the victims that are involved here, and also you're not extending love and compassion to the abuser. That's what we're out there doing, isn't it? Educating people, giving them an opportunity to wake up to this. We're not forcing people to go vegan on the streets. We're talking to them, and through discussion, we hope that they'll wake up and go vegan, right? So education is the most compassionate thing that you can offer anybody when they're the actual victimizer. They're the abuser. What we usually do with criminals who are abusers and victimizers is we put them in prison. We're out on the streets talking to them, trying to help them to waken up to the crimes they're committing. Does that make sense? So this is the best form of compassion that there is. Have you ever heard the expression, you never lie to your friends? Right, now extend that to the public. To me, that's compassion. If you don't lie to your friends and then you extend that to the public, Right? And you just simply focus on telling people the truth. That's compassion. 
That's why people don't respond in the way that you would expect. That's why people respond with respect in response, right? Now, I'm going to get into something that I did start talking about. We promote a sales approach, a value-based sales approach. When I first started out, I noticed a lot of similarities between what people say in the sales world and the training that you get in sales to some of the things we do on outreach to convince people to take animal rights seriously. So I tried to gel the two together, but I think I've created some confusion in doing that because it's created this idea that schmoozing people into veganism and tricking them with these, uh, you know, like again, like a special approach and saying certain things is gonna trick people into being vegan. And this is something I need to squash and that's one thing I'm hoping to squash this year well and truly, because what I mean by sales is convincing somebody of something that they're not already convinced on. That's all. That's all I mean by sales. And I'm also trying to bring over things that are applicable from the sales world into this, so to see what tools can carry over. One of them is a method called feel, felt, found. Okay? I'll also talk about the traditional sales approach, but just one tool I'm going to give you right now is feel, felt, found. When someone says, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but meat tastes too good, so I don't think I could give up meat. Now, only use this tool in circumstances where it's authentic, where you can really relate to what the person is saying in terms of what you went through when you first went vegan. Don't just use this willy-nilly. Use this sparingly, and only use this in those circumstances where you can actually relate. So if they say, oh, I just don't think I could give up meat, well, in that case, I understand how the person feels. So I would say, I understand how you feel. I felt similarly when I was in your position when I first started looking into this. But what I found is you could never justify slicing an animal's throat, stabbing them to death for a sandwich that I don't even need to eat, no matter how much I like the taste. And you bring it back. So you take it away from this trivial nonsense to the reality of what we're talking about and you anchor it in that way. Again, don't use this too often. It's just something you should use sparingly. But again, it's just a tool that comes from the sales world that is applicable here. Make sense? Yeah, I'm not, I can't, I can't imagine myself just not eating meat anyway. Well, I understand how you feel because I felt similarly when I first started looking into this information. Uh -huh. But what I found is that your palate pleasure that you derive from a food item cannot justify the torment and the suffering that we actually cause to those beings. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's, uh, that's kind of uh, horrific how, how, how many animals we kill and how we kill them. Yeah, and you All right, now the three-step process, I'm gonna teach you, again, this is the only two things I'm telling you from the sales world, the feel, felt, found method and the three-step approach. The reason why I'm telling you about this three-step approach is because there's a traditional sales approach for every sale that occurs. And I'm just going to, again, nuts and bolts, I'm going to take you through that traditional process of how it works. The first step is to get somebody emotionally convicted in what you're talking about. The best way to do that, connect them to the sense of injustice and hold them accountable to that injustice. That's the way you get them emotionally convicted in what's going on. The second step is to make it about that individual because people love to say, well, take it up with the government or these industries should be doing better. We should be protesting these industries. They try to palm it off to someone else and instead of taking responsibility, this is a typical human thing. And that's why it's your job to make sure that they understand that they are in the hot seat. They're the ones who are being held to account right now. So don't let them think that this is up to the rest of the world or just food for thought for them to consider. The third step is to tie in the benefits. Now, I've had some improvements here, some developments, and the evolution of my workshops has led me to scrap the initial benefits I used to talk about, which was the first benefit was you no longer have to have this on your conscience, but I realize that's pandering, because when you say that, you're assuming that the person has this on their conscience. You're making them a good person when they haven't even taken action yet to be a good person. That's pandering. I used to say you also will have improved health if you do this properly and you eat a whole foods diet. Mistake, because I'm conflating animal rights with health. And I used to say it's better for the environment, right? If you want a smaller footprint, this is going to be better for the environment. So yeah, 
all these benefits, you know, it's a tick for all of these things. Again, a mistake because I'm conflating animal rights with environmentalism. Now, all we say is that the number one benefit for you being vegan is that you no longer have to be an animal abuser. You no longer have to be a hypocrite because you say that you're against animal abuse. When you're vegan, you live in alignment with those morals that you say you have. That's it. That's the number one benefit. Isn't that the number one benefit that you each got out of this? Was there any other real benefit for taking animal rights seriously? That's the number one reason why you continue to do this, isn't it? Because you don't want to be an animal abusing hypocrite. So that's what we should tell people. Let's not lie to them and say that we all love to be so healthy and environmentally friendly. That's not why we're fucking animal rights activists. Yeah. Right? Also, we're activists because we don't want to enable animal abuse further. <laughs> I don't want to be an animal abuse enabler. That's why I'm not apologetic, you know what I mean? Right. So Can don't. you expand on that? What do you well, mean? Well, when I went vegan, I was no longer an animal abuser. Right. But instead of being a neutral vegan, I'm now an activist. Right. So I don't want to enable animal abuse either. Yeah, you want to stop it. Being neutral around animal abuse. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Right on. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a really good point because we do have to also speak up about this and people are less likely to feel compelled to speak up about this when you make this about the environment and the health as well. Also, we don't have much time with these people. We're on the streets talking to them for five minutes if we're lucky, right? So why would we bring anything else into the conversation other than animal rights? There's only one truth bomb we need them to wake up to and that's animal rights. If you start bringing up health and environment in that little short time that you have with them, they're now thinking about multiple things, aren't they? They're not thinking about animal rights as seriously and as focused as they should be. Plus, the vegan movement is already filled with environmental messages and health messages. We don't need to be another entity doing this. <laughs> People already know about the health aspects of this by now. People already know about the environmental aspects by now. So this is also about acting in accordance to the temperament of the times, right? It's outdated for us to be talking about that now. Let's get with the times and just focus on animal rights, which is what this movement was supposed to be about from the beginning anyway, but we lost our way. So it's our responsibility to bring it back here and anchor it back to what it's supposed to be about. Guilt is effective. It's the only thing that gets people to go vegan. People say, you shouldn't be shaming people. Don't guilt trip them. How else are we gonna get them to go vegan? How else are you gonna get people to take animal abuse seriously if they don't feel guilty for what they're doing? And how are you gonna get them to feel guilty if you don't bring up things that make people feel guilty? Like, you are an animal abuser. If you just suggest that they might be an animal abuser, like as a food for thought philosophical discussion that you have at a bar usually, they're not gonna take it seriously at all, right? It's just food for thought. Yeah, that guy made some good points. They walk off, right? That's it, that's all it ends up resulting in. We don't want that as activists, do we? We want them to really take this issue seriously. And again, it's not malicious. We're not trying to make people feel guilty because we get off on it. We're trying to make people feel guilty because we care about this issue. People also pick up on that. We've got our heart in the right place. Yeah? Unless you're being egotistical and you just love being right and you like owning people in the moment, then the person might react differently to how I'm suggesting. But as long as your heart's in the right place and you're just trying to wake people up to something that's obvious and is obviously wrong, then people won't react negatively. Here's the thing, there's a myth being perpetuated in this movement that people don't care about animals, so that's why we talk about the environment and the health, right? Have you fallen into this thinking? Anybody? I have. Yeah. yeah. This is, again, a huge myth that's been perpetuated in our movement. If someone doesn't care about animals seemingly, it's usually because you're not effectively advocating for the animals. That's it. It's because you're not speaking boldly enough about the animals and you're not holding them to account enough for what they're doing to the animals. If you do all of that and they don't have anything inside them that cares about animal abuse and it being done in their name, then talking about the environment and the health 
is never going to get them to take animal abuse seriously. I promise you that. In fact, to the contrary, people who you focus on environment and health with who then take that serious and become environmentalist vegans or I'm vegan for health, whatever the fuck that means, those people are harder to talk to about veganism because they think they're already doing it. Right? And you say, but you wear leather and I just saw you eat some cream in your coffee. Yeah, but I only do it once a week and blah, blah, blah. And, but what about animal abuse? You said you're a vegan, so don't you take animal abuse seriously? Ah, oh, that's a bit extreme. Oh, I don't need to hear all that. That's a bit too much. I already do my part. But if they got the message from the beginning that there is no alternative to this, you are either an animal abuser or you're not, then maybe they would have gone in the right direction. Same thing with vegetarians. How many people have spoken to a vegetarian that won't listen? All hands go up. People think vegetarians are closer to our cause. They're closer to what we care about. People tell us this all the time. Vegetarians are on our side though. We just need to give them a bit more information and then they'll go vegan. Yeah, okay. Then you step into our shoes and you realize when you talk to these people, they feel entitled. They feel like they're already doing enough. And how dare you ever tell them that they're not? That's the attitude they give you. So why is this? Because we've been promoting that vegetarianism is enough. It is okay. You are an animal defender if you're vegetarian. Vegetarianism is cancer. It's a cancer to our movement. It is, just like reducitarianism is or flexitarianism is. All of these things are cancers to animal rights, to animals getting the justice that they deserve in this world. So when you talk to a vegetarian, they're exactly our target market. Right? If they say, don't worry, you don't need to talk to me, I'm already vegetarian. A lot of Indians say this, a lot of people in general say this. Okay, you're exactly who we need to talk to. We're not promoting vegetarianism because vegetarians hurt animals. All right, I'm going to explain human psychology. Just a little ponder I wrote down one day, okay? A little thought I thought was important to realize. But this is perhaps why people feel so defensive when it comes to this. Number one, if someone's guilty, they're going to be defensive usually, right? Have you ever noticed criminals being pulled into an interrogation room and the police are asking them the tough questions? Yeah, that's how people act when we're outreaching people because they're guilty and they know they're guilty. It's obvious that they have committed crimes. They've probably just ate a burger before they talk to you, right? So I'm going to talk to you about why it seems like a complete nightmare to talk to non-vegan sometimes, okay? When it comes to eating, it is the most intimate connection that we have with the outside world. Think about that. This is why we see people getting a lot more cognitively dissonant and defensive over the food aspect of veganism, as opposed to the clothing or testing aspects. More people are willing to accept that wearing fur is evil, but when it comes to changing their habits, their eating habits rather, their defensiveness is truly astounding. I know you can all relate. This is what I experienced when I was promoting a plant-based diet only for almost two years before I became an animal rights activist. And I need to say that because I don't want anybody ever talking to me about why health is a better way to advocate because I did it for two years straight. Guess how many people to this day are 100% plant-based because of my actions? Anybody? Guess. Yeah, exactly zero. Not even one that I can credit for two years. And I was active as fuck. I was online. I ran a blog, which is still up on Tumblr. It's called The Health Cosmos, if you want to go check it out. Recipes. I had recipes for days. I was consulting with people. I ran a Twitter account with 700 plus followers. I was really doing my thing for two years. Not a single person. No matter how much science I talked about, no matter how much disease I talked about, People don't care about their health. I don't know why we think people care about their health. How many people here eat a 100% whole foods diet? Raise your hand. Not a single person. How many people eat lots of vegan junk food? Raise your hand. Half the room. Okay, why do we expect non-vegans are going to give a shit about their health then? Right? This is not a health message. People feel just the same after they go vegan. 
they don't feel that much better health-wise. We just created this myth or this idea because we want people to take animal rights seriously. Let's be honest. That's the only reason why we started talking about this shit. So when you couple the fact that we are addressing the largest and longest standing injustice on the planet and the most pressing issue of our time, plus the fact that you're addressing the most intimate connection that people have with the outside world, well, you got to expect a nightmare, right? So hopefully that helps to put it into perspective for you why people respond the way they do. This isn't an animal conversation that you're having with people. It's not about animals necessarily and how people feel about animals and do you have a dog in your home or a cat in your home? Surely you have some compassion for animals. Forget about that conversation completely. This is an accountability conversation. People have blood on their hands, regardless if it's an animal or a human. It's a living, breathing, sentient being who suffers in the same way that we suffer, that the person you're talking to suffers. So this is an accountability conversation. You don't have to love animals to be a vegan, do you? Right? We say this all too often though. If you love animals, you don't eat them. You don't eat your friends. Animals are my friends, you would never eat your friends. All these messages are polluting the idea of what this is about. You don't have to love black people to not enslave them, do you? Do you? You just have to understand basic fairness and justice among all of us. That's all you have to do. Same thing applies here. Same exact thing applies here. So accountability is just holding people up to the crimes that they're committing. That's all you're doing as an activist. And that's the other thing I want to say is that I've been saying forget about this special approach idea. I also just want to say that you need to understand what your role is as an activist, what your function is. And that is, and I'm going to make it easier for you to understand, is to simply be a medium of truth. Truth won't prevail in this world unless people are speaking it into reality and acting upon it. Truth exists in our world, but it doesn't act on its own. It just exists. It only acts when it's brought into action by those who are mediums of truth. And that's us as activists. We speak the truth over and over, repeatedly, like a broken record, like a chorus that fills the environment. And then we act upon the truth by getting people to take action, by getting ourselves to take action, by going out into the streets and talking to people. Does that make sense? That's all. That's all you need to think about as an activist. You're a medium of truth. People say sometimes, I only eat meat once in a while. So I'm going to go back to the reducitarian nonsense, okay? The difference between never and once is the difference between good and bad, right? So if people say, oh, I need a little bit of meat, okay, well, you're only a little bit of an animal abuser. Those animals are only a little bit dead. All those animals you just enslaved and killed once a month or twice a month or whatever, how do you justify that, right? So if it's only one animal they kill a month, focus on that one animal. How can you justify killing that one animal? No matter how small the issue is in their heads or how big it is, there's blood on their hands if they're not vegan. So just remember that you don't need to let anyone off the hook unless they're vegan. No one gets off the hook unless they're vegan, okay? Only respond to objections, but don't bring them up. I've made this mistake more than anyone, by the way. Again, I'm telling you what I've tried and what is true as a result of my experience. I've done this a lot, but you might start bringing up things about animal rights and different perspectives in the conversation, but they haven't brought anything up, right? So I'll give you an example. Sometimes I'll say something like, I'll answer their question, and then I've got them thinking. And while I've got them thinking, I'll keep going, right? And I'll go, yeah, and veganism is not a perfectionism pill, right? You don't, it doesn't mean you cause zero harm to animals, you know, you know, I walked over to talk to you, I may have stepped on a bug by accident, right? I'm not going to stop being vegan now. You know, it's, it's about causing the least amount of suffering that's practicable, practically possible in this world. I didn't need to bring that up. He didn't ask. So this is really important. Keep it simple. This is another thing that comes from the sales world, actually. Keep it simple, stupid. Kiss. Because the longer you make it, the more you add to the message, the harder it is for them to consume it. 
So you have to make sure that you keep it as short and as simple as possible. Only bring up points that are relevant to what is happening in that interaction. You've got to ask questions to find out where they're at and only speak to where they're at. Make sense? Whenever you're in doubt, this helps me a lot. Whenever in doubt in these arguments, sometimes you get a little bit sidetracked and you start maybe doubting certain aspects of your argumentation. Whenever in doubt, just compare this to any other injustice. And it's really that simple because people already understand that child abuse is wrong and nobody would ever label themselves a child abuser unless they're a psychopath. So compare this to child abuse and you'll be fine every time. Animals are really no different to children actually. They are our children. They're, we're supposed to be taking care of these animals. We're supposed to be their protectors. That's what parents do, right? So this is really not that much different. When I was saying don't bring things up unless it's brought up by the person that you're outreaching. Also, don't bring up statistics. Minimal amounts of statistics possible, please. Because we're not expert, especially if it's to do with the environment and health. I don't even use those. Because we're not environmentalists. We're not experts in environmental work. We're not environmental activists, are we? We're not health activists either. We're not out there as nutritionists trying to give people the science and education on nutrition. The only reason why we're talking about that stuff is because it's supposed to help the animal rights message. What we are experts in or trying to become experts in is animal rights activists, right? That's what our focus is. So I want you to remember that minimal statistics is better. Less is more in these circumstances. And the last thing I want to say is two things, words to use, words not to use. Now, we as vegans know about the word speciesism. Who here does not? Raise your hand if you've never heard the word speciesism. Okay, the word vegan and the word speciesism, the word carnism, these words are either misunderstood or confusing to people. So I would say use these words, but use them, I want to say sparingly, and focus way more on what these things actually mean. And the words that I've actually become more accustomed to using is human supremacism, because that puts into context what this is really all about. And animal abuse is also the other thing I like to talk about mainly here, because at the core of this, when you're telling someone, so what do you think? You know, are you going to go vegan? It's actually more important to say, more effective to say, so what do you think? Do you think you'll stop abusing animals now? Needlessly? Way more powerful, right? And isn't that what this is all about anyway? So let's be more accurate. And also I could have said, so what do you think? Do you think you'll give up being a human supremacist today? Human supremacism is at the core of this because you think you're so important and so special compared to these other animals. That's really what speciesism is. But I like human supremacism more because it more firmly and accurately describes it. Yeah? Now, I'm going to take you through a interaction because I've been talking to you about a lot of things here, but now I want to take you through a standard interaction from start to end, just so you can get an idea of what it would be like. Another thing I'm going to say is that I think that you should always keep it anchored because non-vegans will take you for a ride every time. When someone's feeling guilty, they'll anchor the conversation the way they want it anchored. And they may even be doing this subconsciously. It may not be conscious. It may not be mal malicious. But because their guilt is flaring up, their defense mechanisms are at play and they're trying to anchor the conversation somewhere else. Oh, but I heard that uh, parents fed their children a vegan diet and killed them. <laughs> right? It's a distraction. All these things are distraction. Oh, yeah, I don't know much about that, but that sounds like a stupid parent to me. Right? It's just stupid parents who don't know how to feed their children properly. Back to the conversation, though. Right? But how do you justify killing animals needlessly? Just to make an example. Always anchor the conversation back to animal rights. And more importantly back to the animal abuse that that individual is committing. So always anchor it back into accountability. And you always find that people will either try to slide their way out of the conversation or they'll be ready to face it. 
But either way, the truth needs to get told to that individual. Another myth is that outreach interactions are only successful if the person says, yes, I agree with you. Like vocally says that to you. But that's, why do we think that that's how people go vegan? You know how people usually go vegan for real? The ones who go vegan for real? They go, hmm, and they walk off. That's probably the best response you're gonna get. So you should see those as successful interactions. Successful interactions are when you say the correct thing on behalf of the animals, regardless of what they say in response. If you have held them to account accurately, if you've said all the correct things on behalf of the animals, that is a successful interaction. Why? Because that's the best you can do as an activist, whether they wake up to it or not and choose to live in alignment with the morals they said they have to the vegan outreacher that they just spoke to is up to them. If we could force people to become vegan, I wouldn't be running these workshops, trust me. I would be out there forcing people to be vegan. Since you can't force people to be vegan, then this is the best that we can do. A successful outreach approach or interaction would be them walking off, but at some point, if they go vegan on their own accord, which it will be on their own accord after you've told them the truth, then you may or may not know about it. You may not know about it, you may not hear about it. We have success stories of people coming back to tell us, but most of these people who go vegan don't end up telling us. So, a standard approach at the Cube, we wait for people to stop and watch the footage on the screen. This helps to pre-qualify the public because we don't want to talk to everybody. Not everybody is ready and willing, like I said, to adopt this truth, to go vegan, to stop abusing animals. So we wait for people to stop and watch the footage. This helps us to understand that this person is at least somewhat open to having a discussion with us. Then we approach them. Now, don't approach them too soon, as soon as they stop. And also, don't approach them too late. So I can't give you a time period here. I'm not going to say 30 seconds on the second. Okay, use your best judgment because somebody might stop. They might be obviously in a rush because they have kids running around and they want to go. Their husbands walked off on them or whatever. So you know that they don't have much time there and it's probably not worth it. And give them 10 seconds, they'll probably walk off. If they're still there after 20 seconds maybe, approach them. But use your best judgment and also just be patient here. Be patient because if you rush in too quickly, it can come off looking bad as well. That always kind of reminds me of when you walk into a retail store and they go, can I help you with anything? It's like, I just walked in. Like, can I at least have a look first before I might have any questions? So when someone does stop and they're watching the footage, we approach them and then we say, hi. Would you like to know why we're here? We used to say, have you ever seen this footage before? Again, we've updated this. Why do we ask, would you like to know why we're here? Because we need that commitment from the individual. We need this to be a two-way conversation. Good. Would you like to know why we're here? Yeah, yeah, yeah? absolutely. Yo, what's going on, guys? Yeah. Would you like to hear what we're doing here? Oh, sure, yeah. What's going on? Would you like to know what we're doing? Uh, I yeah? What do you think we're doing? Right. How they can are in the sheds and stuff. They don't say yes to that, and they, or they don't show some kind of affirmative response in wanting to know why we're there, then what makes you think that you're going to be able to have a successful conversation with them anyway? They have to at least be open to that. So if they say, yes, I'd like to know why you're here, or they try to guess why you're here, some kind of affirmative answer as to giving you the open floor so you can talk. At that point, then I'll describe what we're showing on the screen. So I'll describe the fact that we're showing footage of what happens in the meat, dairy, and egg industries and what happens in every other industry that exploits animals, that abuses animals rather. That's the other thing. Exploitation is a word I seldomly use because people translate exploitation to child slavery in sweatshops and they don't think of it as animals getting stabbed to death and their heads cut off. They don't think of that as exploitation. So I just refer to animal exploitation as animal abuse because that's what animal exploitation is anyway. So I explain that this footage is covering the meat, dairy and egg industries and all industries 
that exploit animals, including the free range, organic, grass fed, cage free, humane certified industries. This is what you're viewing on the screen. Yeah, so what we're doing is we're showing the behind the scenes of industries that abuse animals. Meat, dairy, eggs. So what we're showing shows what happens to animals in meat, dairy and egg industries. So what we're showing on the screens is standard practice footage of what happens in the meat, dairy and egg industries and even the industries that label themselves free range, grass fed, organic, humane certified. We're showing all of that on the screens. You have to gauge from the individual how they feel about what they're seeing and how they feel about animal abuse in general. So I ask, do you think animal abuse is wrong? Or my other favorite question is, do you think stabbing animals to death for a sandwich is wrong? What I'm getting from what you just said is that you think this is wrong? I do. Yeah, would you say that this is evil, what we do f for a sandwich? Yeah. Are you guys against the animal abuse? Yes, animal abuse, yeah. Do you find this to be wrong, what we're doing to animals? Definitely. So would you say you're against this? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay, so this is the first question to get them connecting to why we're there. And then they're going to go into their response. Oh, yeah. The response that I always get, by the way, is yes, of course. I never get any other response. No one ever says, no, I don't think it's wrong. I'm totally all for animal abuse. Everyone has said to me, of course I'm against animal abuse. Yeah, I do think it's wrong that we stab animals to death for a sandwich. But then they get into their excuses. Right? So this is where you have to respond to the objections. Yeah, but don't plants have a life as well? Yeah, but I mean, the circle of life. <laughs> you know? And then so you respond to the objection, you deal with it, and I'm not going to get into every excuse and how to deal with them because you should all know by now I think in this movement there's enough information out there to find out what the response is to plants have feelings God says it's okay but we do have a Q&A coming up and if you guys have any questions regarding any arguments that you're stuck on I'm more than happy to help you with them but I'm not going to get into that during this now I'm just going to tell you that you deal with the objection the excuses are all ridiculous too easy to deal with once you deal with them again you have to anchor it back Okay, so now we've dealt with the fact that plants don't have feelings. How do you justify killing animals when you don't need to? So you always bring it back to the fact that there is injustice afoot. Right, so what we're showing on the screen today is footage of animal agriculture. We're showing what the meat, dairy and egg industries and other industries do to abuse animals. Do you think stabbing animals to death for a sandwich is wrong? Yes, I do. Now, the response usually to this is, what do you think you can do about it? Because again, you've got them, this is very quick, you've got them on the emotional aspect of connecting to what's happening here. Not fully, but you've got them enough. You've got them enough on that point because you've started that interaction that way. What do you think you can do about it as an individual? What do you think you can do about it? Not buy the product. Right. So if you think that it's evil, what do you think you could do about it? Not eat meat or use much. Exactly. Okay, and what do you think you can do about it? Stop eating ham sandwiches. Be vegan. Yeah? Now, usually people say, well, I guess I could stop eating them because it's so fucking obvious. <laughs> but then the excuses come in. Yeah, but we've always been doing this, haven't we? Our ancestors did it, blah, blah, blah. It's always been around. So again, back to the objection handling, but then you anchor it back immediately after you handle the objection. So how do you justify abusing animals, right? It's a little bit of back and forth in that section of the outreach. Back and forth, deal with the objection, hold them accountable. But it's always deal with the objection, go back to holding them accountable. Then at the end, you tie in the benefit. Once you've got them really thinking, stumped, they've conceded, no more excuses. Do you know what the number one benefit is for you to be vegan? You no longer have to be an animal abuser. And you can live in alignment with the morals that you say you have because you said that this was wrong. Right? So, do you know what the number one benefit is for you personally to be vegan? As an individual? I'm not sure though, but I've read a lot about it, like less yeah. fat, less, uh, you know, all these things. And keep it yes, there are, health, and there are health yeah. um, imp impacts, but actually the number one benefit for you as an individual 
is that when you are vegan, you no longer have to be a hypocrite. Because you say this is wrong, because it is wrong, it's evil. But if you're not vegan, you're pro-animal abuse. Do you guys know what the best benefit of going vegan is? No. The best benefit is that you guys no longer have to be hypocrites. Because if you guys are against animal abuse while paying for this, then you guys are abusing animals. So the best benefit is that then you can just walk away from this and no longer have to be the reason that these animals suffer and you can be against animal cruelty with your actions. And at the end, the way that we should be closing, and this is a very, very important part of the interaction, it's very, very important that you close the interaction by asking, so what do you think you're going to do about this? Are you going to stop abusing animals from today and become vegan or not? What do you think about what I've said? What do you think you'll do about this? We're going vegan. Okay. Like now. We're going vegan now. What do you think you're going to do about it in your day to day life? Uh, not contribute to uh, farming that promotes this kind of uh, disrespect and, and violence towards other living organisms. Absolutely. What do you think you're going to do about this? You're going to go vegan? You know what? I am. Yeah? I am. You guys think you're gonna do it? You're gonna stop abusing animals? I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop a lot of this shit. You're gonna stop? You're gonna go vegan? Yes, sir. You're going vegan right now? Yeah. Today's the day. Fuck yeah. So you think you'll go vegan? Very good to hear. Good to hear. You have to close it off with that question. Because you let them know what the imperative is from that, from that point on. That you're not just gonna say, have a nice day, thanks for listening, without asking that accountability question. Right? Then once they answer, you can say, have a nice day. Cool? That's the whole interaction, guys. It's not that complex, is it?